invite you back to your seats and to open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, chapter 6. Chapter 6 this morning. Before we get into the message, I just wanted to seize a little bit of a, a pastoral moment, if I could, and remind you of a couple things we talked about a, a month ago or so, or two months ago, regarding the way we can conduct ourselves uh, in the course of this election season. I know it's challenging season for many of us for a diverse number of reasons, thinking about the future, the temptation to worry whenever there's an election of this magnitude, and certainly some of the difficulties of this election made it particularly difficult, challenging. Um, I was talking to some guys last night, just brought it back to mind how important it is for us to do a couple of things. Number one, to spend as much time talking about the absolute trustworthiness of God's sovereignty more time actually on that than we do our evaluation of candidates and the possibilities of what might happen on election day and afterwards. Very easy to jump into a conversation about various candidates and their their weaknesses and so forth, but often we need to turn the conversation to the absolute assurance that we have as Christians. God rules over the nations. He lifts up and takes down princes as he will according to his own wisdom. We need to just keep that in mind. The second thing I want to encourage us to do as we kind of come into the final month here, where the media obviously is frantically trying to grab a hold of every soundbite, every every comment now historic that's ever been made by the candidate. There's a, there's a certain pace you can detect, a kind of a, a franticness that picks up. And I think as, as Christians, as the world becomes more and more frantic, we need to devote ourselves increasingly to prayer, to supplication, to calling out for the Lord, to raise up godly leaders in our nation, wise leaders, moral leaders. So that should be our prayer, our hearts. We may wonder how he's going to do that, but we can certainly pray that he would do that. So let me just encourage us in those two simple categories. I know there's more we can talk about, but just those simple categories. And in talking about this, let's turn our conversations at some point to the sovereign goodness of God over our lives, over his church, over his people, over the world. And then also, let's take time to pray certainly more than we take time to evaluate and, and critique and so forth. Just an encouragement as we're going into, I know you're sensing it, I'm sensing it, just the franticness of this election season, two things we should certainly be doing. Well, I've been uh, looking forward to this final chapter in Ephesians. It is unique in some ways because of the metaphor Paul uses. It's a beloved metaphor that many Christians have known for many years. It's It's vivid. There's a, a memorableness to it, as Paul talks about the armor of God. And so what I'd like to do this morning is, is again, read the whole section, and we're going to look sort of at the, the second half of this section this morning. Uh, so we looked at the first part of it last week. We're going to look at the second half this morning. So let's begin reading in verse 10 of Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm. Now our section this morning. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me. That words may be given to me and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. 
a well-loved Christian book called Pilgrim's Progress depicts a Christian named Pilgrim on his way to Zion, the heavenly city. I'm sure many of you have read it or heard of this story. And he faces in a physically, kind of a metaphor way, a number of the things that the Bible says Christians face and need as they make their way towards heaven. And at one point, he has an encounter with the devil himself called Apollyon in the book. And this battle portrays in a physical way what Paul is describing is happening to us spiritually. So I thought I'd read just an excerpt from it this morning so we could kind of get into the metaphor of what it means for us to be in the midst of a spiritual battle, that to be a Christian is to be a soldier in a battle. But that identity, identity needs to be pressed into our consciousness. To be a Christian is to be a soldier in a battle with an enemy that is more powerful than we are in our own strength and whom we can only defeat in the strength of the Lord. John Bunyan says this, but now in this valley of humiliation, poor Christian, that's the Christian, was hard put. He had gone but a little way when he espied a foul enemy coming over the field to meet with him. Now, the monster was hideous to behold. And when he had come up to Christian, he beheld him with a disdainful countenance and thus began to question him. Then goes on to question Christian probing, as it were, his strengths and his confidence in the gospel, trying to lure him away from the path, inviting him to turn aside, to come back into the service of Apollyon. But Christian is not easily persuaded. So later on, it says that Apollyon broke into a grievous rage, saying, I am an enemy to this prince. I hate his person, his laws, and people. I come out on purpose to withstand you. Christian replies, Apollyon, beware what you do, for I am in the king's highway, the way of holiness. Therefore, take heed to yourself. Then Apollyon straddled quite over the whole breadth of the way and said, I am void of fear in this matter. Prepare yourself to die, for I swear by my infernal den that you shall go no farther. Here will I spill your soul. He had almost, says, pressed him to death. So the Christian began to despair of life, but as God would have it, while Apollyon was fetching his last blow to make a full end of this good man, Christian reached out his hand for his sword and caught it, saying, Rejoice not against me, O my enemy. When I fall, I shall rise. And with that gave him a deadly thrust, which made him give back as one who had received his mortal wound. And Christian, perceiving that, made at him again, saying, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And with that, Apollyon spread forth his dragon's wings and sped him away. So when the battle was over, Christian said, I will here give thanks to him that has delivered me out of the mouth of the lion, to him that helped me against Apollyon. Charles Spurgeon said this, Put on the whole armor of God and look upon life as a continued battle. Be surprised when you have not to fight. Be wonderstruck when the world is peaceful towards you. Be astonished when your old corruptions do not rise and assault you. You must travel with your swords always drawn, and you may as well throw away the scabbard, for you will never want it. You are a soldier. You must always fight. And by the light of battle, you must survey the whole of your life. You are a soldier, must always fight. And by the light of battle, you must survey. We must survey the whole of our life. Paul's urgent plea here at the end of Ephesians. He's described what Christ has done in redeeming and saving and rescuing and building a church together. 
an army, so to speak, that displays the wisdom of God. His call at the end is to live out the implications of all that Jesus has done. And he uses the metaphor of armor for living out our union with Christ. But the passage here is not calling us to save ourselves or to rescue ourselves ultimately from God's judgment. But it is saying we have to live out the reality of our union with Christ. That's really what it means to put on the armor of God. It means live out in daily life, in the face of the opposition of the enemy, the armor that is our union with Christ, the inheritance, the possessions, the tools that God has given us in Christ. Live it out. Put it on. Function in it. Your Christian life is not a, a passive stroll, Paul says. No, it's a, it's a battle, and the gospel that has been given to us must function for us on a daily basis. The reality of who we are in Christ has to be a, a daily put on, a, an arming ourselves with these truths. Stand firm, Paul says. In the passage we're looking at this morning, stand therefore. In light of all that I've said, stand. Withstand, you might say. Stand firm. The enemy approaches. Stand your ground. Do not give in. Do not turn around. Do not bow. Do not beg. Stand your ground. Stand, therefore, he says in verse 14. Stand firm in the face of evil in the armor of God. In the face of evil, stand firm in the armor of God. That's the call of this passage. That's that overarching command in verse 14. Stand. But if you can imagine a, a, a person in one of those ancient battles, like the Romans used to fight, standing bare. No armor, no shield, no helmet, no sword, while an enemy equipped with arrows and spears and swords and shields, comes raging towards them. Paul views the Christian who neglects his gospel armor to be functionally in a day-to-day -day basis like that person who just bears his heart and body to an enemy determined to ruin them. In some ways, you could see the, the beginning and end of Ephesians a, a bit like bookends, where at the beginning, it, it's all talking about what God has done. God has saved you, and God has guaranteed your inheritance, and you cannot be lost. God will preserve you in the end. Crucial, fundamental truth pillar of salvation. But then at the end, he says, now, in your day-to-day -day experience, though, it's going to feel like you have to fight. For your very soul, you have to fight. Now, ultimately, go back to chapter 1, God preserves, and God protects, and, and God guarantees that you will make it to the end. But our experience and the way in which God preserves us is going to feel like putting on armor every day because an enemy is charging at us and left to ourselves we're bare and vulnerable. It's, it's this the mystery of the balance between God ultimately preserves but Christians must fight. The gospel is not something that we do and yet we have to apply it on a daily basis. You see, the, the mystery there, ultimately God preserves his people. God ultimately is the shield for his people, the refuge, as Psalm 46 says. In times of need, God is our refuge. God is our strength. But in fulfilling his strength, we, we have to apply that strength. We have to place it on us, so to speak. That's the point of this passage. Now, all of these these pieces of armor, I think, sometimes can be a distraction to us, as though we're, we're trying to distinguish now, why why did he call this a shield and this a belt? The key is not to distinguish why is this a belt and this a shield. The point is to, to feel the overarching metaphor. You're in a battle, and everything you've been given in Jesus Christ, you're a new person in Christ, is like a, a military equipment arsenal. Uh, to paraphrase John Calvin, the commentator, he said, look, look, the goal is not to distinguish why is this a girdle and this a shield so much. But the goal is to say, look, all that you have in Christ is necessary, is essential for us to resist the enemy that is coming furiously to oppose us. Stand firm in light of the spiritual opposition. We must stand firm in the armor of our Lord. 
it's worthless to give ground, but it's equally worthless to try to stand without the armor that God has given us. To stand in our own strength and to flee are equally hopeless. There are two ways we stand. We stand in our armor, we stand in our armor, and we stand in prayer. We stand in our armor, and we stand in prayer. Let's just walk through these these pieces of armor and try to understand what Paul is saying. I think all of these come from this metaphor of our union with Christ. In the Old Testament, uh, the servant of the Lord is described as, as a warrior who has an instrument of judgment coming out of his mouth, and who's, who's decked and arrayed as a warrior, who's conquering enemies. And since Paul talks so often in Ephesians of being in Christ, if you go back to chapter 1, he says it over and over and over again. You have all these possessions because you are in Christ. This idea of being placed inside the Lord Jesus Christ, linked with him, united with him, means in terms of our battle that he has provided for us possessions that we would not have on our own, but that we can make use of in the fight. That's the idea. Live out, earlier in the, in the section he talks about putting on, put on the new man. So live out or function in or clothe yourself in your new identity in Jesus Christ. That's another way of saying put on the armor of God. Live out or put on your new identity in Jesus Christ on a daily basis. Apply it, function in it. And here's some practical ideas of what that means. He says that truth is like a belt. Having put on the belt of truth, he says, the idea here is a belt that would have, would have basically girded up a, a soldier's long robes so that they could be ready for action. The idea is without this belt, you would be encumbered by perhaps robes or, or some kind of, of dress that would, would make you vulnerable to, to trip or not to be ready for action. So this belt prepared you for battle. And I, this could be the truth of God, like objective truth, put on the truth of God. But since he talks about the Word of God later, uh, the commentators that I trust anyway, uh, they seem to think this has more to do with our living out God's truth and displaying it in our life. So it's, it's more like uh, God's truthfulness that is displayed in our truthfulness. It's not just kind of a, 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 a view of truth in a general sense, but... It, it has in mind, I think, this metaphor, a person that is wrapped up in lies and deceit and darkness is not prepared for a battle against the prince of darkness. That's the metaphor. If you can imagine a, a person who has long flowing robes, maybe, in that day and age, and those flowing robes in this metaphor are deceit and living in a lie and living in darkness and concealing aspects of your life and so forth, Paul's saying, look, look, that, there's no way you're going to do battle against the prince of lies if you're caught up in lies and deceit. So you need to wear the truthfulness that you've been given in Jesus Christ. Your new man, your new man is a, a person of truth and grace. And you must live that out if you're going to be prepared for this battle. Live out the union with Christ you've been given and I've been given. Live out a life of truth, so to speak, so you're not caught up in the lies that will cause you unable to fight against the enemy. He goes on to say, righteousness is a breastplate. Think of those those old soldiers with that big metal thing over their chest, over their heart, their organs. He says, righteousness is a, is a breastplate for you. Now again, this could be righteousness that is imputed to us, in other words, our legal standing with the Lord Jesus Christ. But again, reading smart commentators to speak, they think, I don't think that's what Paul is referring to in this case. Now, certainly, we do live in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the legal righteousness that we don't contribute to at all. But in this case, they think what Paul is describing more is the righteousness that we've been given as a way of life because we have been united to Christ. And again, similar to truth, he's saying, look, if, if you are living in that righteousness and living it out on a daily basis, if you're living in your union with Christ, you are defended from the snares of the enemy. And we can see how true that is spiritually. On the other hand, if you're giving in to your old self, exposed to all manner of desire and wickedness and practicing unrighteousness, well, you're exposed to the enemy. That's That's causing yourself to be living in his ways, to be walking towards his ranks. You're not defended against his temptations. 
our union with Christ should cause us to wear righteousness boldly and, and proudly, we might even say, that we live righteously before the Lord. It's like a breastplate for us that guards us from the snares and the attacks of the enemy. It says we're to have shoes given by the readiness of the gospel of peace. The imagery here is of a, of a soldier who gets ready in the morning for the battle that afternoon. So you can picture him in his barracks. Paul has this in mind. What does what the Christian soldier do? He puts on truth because of his union with Christ. He puts on righteousness because of his union with Christ. He puts on shoes ready to give the gospel of peace. Most likely it's a reference to Isaiah 52 where a messenger runs over the mountains shouting to the people, Peace! Peace! God reigns! God has won the victory! They think Christians are like that. They, they're, they're ready to declare the victory of the king, the victory of the mighty warrior. And in some ways, they live out his message. They are in some ways his own messengers, his own voice speaking. The conquering king has won. Peace. Come to him. Be reconciled to him. Jesus Christ has conquered death. There is no longer fear of hell if you will come to him. Our warfare against God has been defeated at the cross. God has judged sin in Jesus. And if you come to Jesus, you can know God too. Peace. Peace to this world. An enmity with God. Paul says, ironically, the Christian soldier shouts, peace. Because the victory has already been secured. The warrior has already won his victory. And in our battle, we proclaim that the victory has been secured in Christ. The army says, choose the readiness talked about this a couple weeks ago, something we want to grow in as a church, being ready to give the gospel of peace, looking for opportunities. My kids seem to perpetually be losing their shoes. It's a really astonishing ability to lose shoes um, over a five-minute span. They lose them in the car, they lose them before they get to the car, it's a very challenging thing. And, and then there's the times we've made it all the way to some other place. And then we found out, well, they, they left their shoes at home. So now, you know, we're going to be on the very fit in this, uh, you know, nice barrier or somebody's home or something. But Paul's saying a Christian that's not ready to preach the gospel is like a soldier going in battle on shoes. Back in those days, they didn't have tanks and armored vehicles. Without your shoes, you're worthless as a soldier. And he's saying, look, your shoes are essential to what God is doing on the earth. You have a part to play. And the readiness given by the gospel of peace is as essential to you as footwear was to a soldier who had to march his way to battle and march his way out. We need to see this part of our armor. The Christian arsenal is not merely about avoiding contact with the world. It's about proclaiming that the divine warrior has conquered sin and death and the devil, and that now he offers amnesty to all who will come to him. He offers pardon to all who will repent of their sins and believe in him. He offers to every person who has previously opposed God to come to him in peace and to be reconciled. And the Christian is the mouthpiece of that message and desires to be ready to give it. As Paul keeps going and taking up this armor so that we can stand in his army, he seems to have a, a sense of the urgency of this next one. Because you notice there in, in verse 17, it says, Take the helmet of salvation. Take the helmet of salvation. Take up the shield of faith in verse 16. There's a slight change in the grammar such that there's, a, there's a, a command and urgency to this next one. I, I don't think he's not urgent about the previous ones, but I think he just feels these, these next few in a particular way. Take them up, he says. Take up first the shield of faith, 
with which you can extinguish all of the flaming darts of the evil one. Now, in our modern warfare, we don't totally understand the imagery here, but it's actually a, a brilliant metaphor. In the, in the old days that Paul is referring to, we have these big wooden shields. This shield he's talking about here is about two feet by four feet long. Huge shield. Covered most of the body. Right? Stood in front of the rest of the armor. And they would put fabric or some kind of animal skin on the front of it, and then they would soak it in water. Because they, when the enemy would light arrows or javelins with pitch and light it on fire, uh, when they would shoot that, the, the arrow would come, they would you know, go into the shield, but then it would extinguish in the, the shield, which was soaked in the water. If you didn't do that, eventually the, the shield would catch on fire, you'd have to ban the shield, and then you're exposed. So Paul's saying, look, your faith is like that kind of shield. Faith is this ability to lay claim on the promises of God, to believe that God is true despite what Satan says about him, despite what the world says about him, despite what our heart wants to say about him. It says, no, God is true. God is trustworthy. That's what faith says. I think it's a reference to our faith. And he's saying, look, that kind of faith that you have been given in Christ, faith in the Bible is a gift of God, it's not something we work up on our own. It's, it's given. So in our union with Christ, we are given this shield of faith that we can then exercise. Paul says, don't leave it at home. Jesus gave it to you, and it's perfectly crafted to extinguish the flaming darts of the enemy. So imagine you're out there in that field, and here comes this roaring enemy, and they start shooting flaming arrows at you. It's awfully nice to have a shield that you can lift up over your head that not only will protect you from the arrows, but from the flames that come attached to those arrows. In other words, the faith that you've been given has everything you need to extinguish every flaming dart of the enemy. Don't leave home without it. It's better applied to the shield of faith. Take it up, Paul says. Take it up. I can't imagine soldiers march their way 12 miles to the battle seat and say, oh, Sarge, my shield. I, I love my shield. That probably never happened. Because it's life and death. It's life and death. This is an inconvenience to leave your shield at home. It's essential to take your shield with you into battle. The shield of faith that lays claim to the promises of God. I can only imagine that Paul had in mind that interaction with Eve in the garden. That interaction she had with Satan, where Satan just lobbing questions her way, calling into question the goodness of God. Did God really not let you eat this tree? How little miserly God is that? He's just insinuating about God's character and God's faithfulness. Any questions God's truthfulness, you're not going to die. You're not going to die. Nothing's going to happen. I don't think he pictures those these flaming arrows designed to create a conflagration of the soul. And Eve is scorched by it. He says, look, in Christ, you've been given shield. Awareness of the promises of God. You can lay claim on the promises of Christ. And if you, you hold that shield up, it will guard you. It will extinguish the flaming darts of the enemy that are coming your way. Hold it up. Take it up. Stand firm with the shield of faith. Don't you dare try to stand firm without it. Don't you dare think you can resist the enemy without it. You can't resist the enemy without it. We can't even resist our own heart without it. My own heart is too vulnerable to try to live life without faith, let alone facing the onslaught of the enemy. Have you ever had moments where you just felt like your, your soul was discouraged or you were so tempted by the seductive nature of some sin. And you felt yourself just desiring to enjoy the pleasures of sin or to wallow in doubt or grief or cynicism for some period of time. It just felt better. I just want to go in that direction. Paul says, in that moment, you do not have the strength to stand. You're like a soldier on a hill, exposed to every flaming arrow of the enemy. But in Christ, you have a shield of faith. He's given you. It's a faith that claims the promises of God, that God is true, that he's not a liar, that God's promises will always be certain, and that his promises to me are certain and secure. And I can lift that over my head and say, no, I will not believe these lies that emanate 
escape from this enemy. Stand firm, Paul says, with the shield of faith. He says, take up the helmet of salvation. Again, we don't save ourselves. It's some self-salvation here. This whole point is apply and believe in and function in the truth of what Jesus has done. So this helmet is, is just remembering and reassuring yourself and living in the truth of the salvation that Christ has provided. You can almost imagine Paul thinking of, of Satan as that great accuser. Have you ever read that passage in the Old Testament where the accuser comes to the high priest and just begins to accuse him before God? Paul man does that with Christians. Satan does that with people. You can't be saved. You've fallen too many times. God doesn't mean you. He's talking about the people he loves. God would love you if only you could love him. God would help you if only you could try. What can defend us from that kind of accusation, from the questions about whether God could finally preserve us to the end, or whether our sin and our desire for evil will just finally at the end, it'll, it'll just prove too great. In the end, our, our head, so to speak, is just vulnerable finally to our own sin. We're going to destroy ourselves. Paul says, no, to take up the, the helmet of salvation. Remind yourself of the truth that if Christ died and was buried and rose again, then you have an assurance that you will be with God forever. And that no sin and no devil is more powerful than the salvation of Christ Jesus. And no failure to believe on your part is stronger than the salvation that God has given to every Christian. He's placed on your head like a helmet. God is the Savior and not man. God is the rescuer and not man. It is not up to a man's strength or a woman's strength to make it to the end. God ultimately saves and God alone. And remembering those truths is like taking up the helmet that is our salvation and placing it on our head for the daily battle. One of my heroes, Jerry Bridges, who home with the Lord this last year, he would say, preach the gospel to yourself. I think Paul would love that for us. I think that's exactly what he means when he says, take up the helmet of salvation. Well, save yourself, but, but man, put it on your head for the day of the battle. Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who has been raised to life. And God made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteous of God. And there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For Christ made him to be, or God made him to be a curse, so that in him we might receive the favor of God. And we've been justified in Christ through a righteousness not our own, but given to us in Christ Jesus. On the helmet of salvation. Strong with any blow of the enemy. Any accusation of your own conscience. Finally, says, take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The sword is God's Word. Of the Spirit means that the Spirit is the author of that Word, He's the one that gives it its divine power. He's saying, look, the sword is necessary, it's essential, it's an offensive weapon, it fights against the enemy, it's also a defensive weapon, it parries his thrust towards you, it guards you as well. He's saying, God's word in your hand and in your heart is like a sword, sharp, to destroy the strongholds of the enemy, to destroy his arguments and lies against you and against God. It's empowered by God himself. Revelation speaks of Jesus, of of having a sword coming out of his mouth. He is the word of God. And the word of God, the Bible, has its focus and its center on Jesus. So to to wield the sword of the Spirit is to proclaim the truth of God's word centered on the person of Jesus Christ, whether it be to ourselves, to our neighbors, to the enemy himself. Take up, Paul says. The sword of the Spirit. Take it up. Take it up. Speak. Declare. I imagine that Paul had in mind the, the story of Jesus going into the wilderness 
from the enemy tempts him. I will give you all the kingdoms of the world. You will just bow down and worship. Jesus answers with the soul of the Spirit. You shall worship the Lord God with the bone of the shadows. Throw yourself down from the temple. Prove, prove that you're the Son of God. Jesus answers, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Take one of these stones and make them bread. I know God wants you in this wilderness, but just, just use your power for your own comfort. And it's not good by bread. By every word that comes from that God. Jesus is the ultimate warrior, clothed in the Spirit, in the Spirit, defeating the Prince of Darkness. And the sword of, of God's word was in his hand, strong, able to resist and fight us and slay the enemy. And he says, look, in your union with Christ, you must wield that sword too. You must function with it. Stand firm, Paul says, in the armor of the Lord, equally useless to run and equally useless to try to stand without this armor. So we stand apart from the privileges and gifts and possessions of our union with Christ, worthless. We will fail. Imagine, if you can, the, the anti armor of God Christian. To stand against the charge of the enemy with the snare of a lifestyle of sin, lies, wrapping themselves around our feet, not holding up by truth. We've been caught living in a lie, stumble, trip. Fall and go to those new temptations the next time, the next time. Go to temptation. It's having wrapped around your feet. Not living out the truthfulness of our God. We'd have a heart exposed by habits of wickedness, patterns, practicing sin, not living out the union of Christ. It's like a soldier just takes off his breastplate, just exposes himself. Maybe listening to the publications of the world rather than ready to proclaim the gospel. How about this? I think about this from my own heart. I'm spending more time listening to the perspective of the world or declaring the truth about Jesus. We are shield arm. Just hold a big target called down. All day long. Doubts. Allowed to score over and over again. Maybe God isn't there. Maybe God won't be faithful. Maybe He isn't really trustworthy. Maybe He is, but maybe He isn't. We have our head bare by forgetfulness, neglect of the gospel, forgetting the truths of our salvation, maybe thinking more often that we need to save ourselves or work harder to get into God's faith and putting on or preaching to ourselves the truth of reality, the objective assurance of our salvation. Being with having our hands and our mouths empty of God's word. But in that moment when the enemy comes at us, his blade, we have no answer. This is the picture that Paul has in view, and he wants to guard us against. You notice in these in the, the armor here, there's nothing unusual or mysterious. You notice that. It's not like the armor of God is some strange, mysterious thing, some super faith, or some super knowledge of God's word, or some extra special salvation. This isn't like secret weaponry. It's very plain stuff. It's very obvious kinds of things with profound power. Paul's not playing here to the super Christian 
not dying on armor. I was compared to the average Christian who just has this little piddly slingshot. Now he's dead out. Now everything God uses to do extraordinary power to cause Christians to stand firm. It's the ordinary things of our possession in Christ that are actually extraordinary in our ability to give us strength to stand. Trustfulness. Living in righteousness. Remembering our salvation. Remembering the promises of God by faith. Holding up the word of God on a daily basis. These are not weird, unusual, super Christian things. These are normal things, but they have extraordinary power to resist the enemy. Sometimes I think we're tempted to, to want something extraordinary. You, you go and you see this in book stores and even the titles of certain Christian conferences. As though there's, there's some secret out there that most Christians are missing. That if we could just grab a hold of that, well, then you would experience victory. Paul's not trying to impress anybody. Truth, righteousness, faith, remembering your salvation, God's word. Okay. It's true. Ferocious. And I'm weak. Do you know how weak I am? Do you know how weak I feel in the morning when I can't sleep at night and my mind is racing? Do you know how weak I feel when my co workers are joking crudely? Do you know how weak I feel late at night when the internet is calling my name? Do you know how weak I feel when I've given into that sin again and I'm just tempted to give it up in despair and say, forget it, I don't care? Do you know how weak I feel? I feel so weak. Paul says, you are weak, but in Christ you are strong. You know the armor? You're weak. You're flesh. You're bone. You're blood. You can be taken out, but in Christ you have armor that is more than enough to meet the snares of the enemy, to extinguish his flaming darts. You don't have to be strong. You have to receive the strength of the Lord. Stand in your armor. Secondly, stand in prayer. The verses, if you notice in your Bible, verse 18 and following, are not a piece of armor, so to speak, as they are a demeanor or a manner which should be true of the Christian as they apply or put on all the armor. So that, that's the way the grammar uh, unfolds here. That doing these things, standing firm in our armor, should take place in the spirit in which we are praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication, keeping alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. I know they, they break it up in the English typically with two different senses there in the middle of verse 18, but these are just sort of rolling descriptions in the original. They're just descriptions of what it looks like for the Christian to take on their armor, to stand firm, to stand firm in your armor, and what demeanor should you have in that praying all the time? And the emphasis on comprehensive prayer I could not be made more stark. Notice this. Uh, verse 18. Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To the end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. If Paul's trying to be emphatic, the Christian life and the Christian fight cannot be won without pervasive prayer. Paul is not picturing a soldier who puts on his armor and goes out to battle without any reference to God. He's not saying, look, put on these truths and just go out and fight the fight. He's saying, let me me help you explain the metaphor. Maybe that's why he didn't use prayer as a piece of armor, because the metaphor starts to break down. It's not so much that you have armor and you keep, keep it as a possession and you go out and you fight your battle. It's more like your union with God in Christ should be flowing towards you all the time and should be a constant source of protection for you. You see why the metaphor breaks down? Because a soldier doesn't, you know, keep the connections like the armor's connected somehow. No, but in the spiritual world, it is. You see, that this armor is, is useless without a connection to the Lord Jesus Christ. You might think of some of those silly sci-fi movies where the armor's powered and it has to have power to do its thing. Or, like, if you watch any of the Marvel stuff before, he has this armor, but it has to be kind of powered armor, it's energized armor, somehow. That's kind of what Paul has in mind. 
talking to a sister last night that struggles with her health and I, I was just thanking her for her example.
and she's following God. There's people around us that are, are fighting these kinds of fights and temptations, and we need to pray for them that they will stand firm, just as we need to pray for ourselves. How do we stand firm? We stand firm putting on these aspects or elements or gifts of our union with Jesus Christ. And, and don't get hung up on the, the, the list here, so this is the only armor. That's not Paul's point. But he's basically saying, look, your union with Christ has to be a living, <coughs> breathing, daily aspect of your life. It has to be something you do on a daily basis. And you can't just do it mechanically. It should be done in, in prayer, seeking and calling out to the Lord. As you do that, God, all power and strength, will enable you to stand firm. Will enable you to keep standing against the onslaught of the enemy. What Paul's doing as he wraps up this letter is he's saying, Look, God has given you, given me, an inheritance in Jesus that is beyond our understanding. He's rescued us, He's brought us together. But there is something for us to do. The defeat is secure. But the fight will be experienced until Jesus returns. The victory is guaranteed, but we will feel the battle. And we have everything we need to fight the battle. But we must fight the battle standing firm in the armor of the Lord. The armor of our union with Christ prayerfully seeking out the power of God to sustain us. At the end of that book, Pilgrim's Progress, there's this wonderful moment where Pilgrim, the Christian, makes his way across the river of death. And as he's making his way across that river, even then, even at the end, He's still fighting, he's struggling, wondering, doubt is there, am I, am I going to make it? But his friend is there to help him, and to link arms with him. And they make it across the river, and they go into the celestial city, and you just have this vision of the, the gates open. And the face of the Lord, the Lord, the King, coming to see them. The trumpets sounding. Brothers and sisters, that will be the end of this struggle. There will come a day when sin will be no more. When Jesus will take us home or will return to take us home. And every moment we spent putting on our armor, getting up, getting ready for the next day, praying for our brothers and sisters, will turn into trumpet fanfare of celebrating God's grace and getting us there. Let's keep standing firm until that day comes. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I want to obey this passage right now and pray for my brothers and sisters. I pray that you enable them to stand firm this week. I pray, Lord Jesus. I pray for any that are facing particular temptations, that you enable them to stand firm against the snares of the enemy. I pray for any who are convicted of, of some aspect of darkness or deceit in their life, that you would enable them right now to take a stand for truth. But I pray for any that have been tempted by doubt, that you would supply strength to their faith, claim the promises of God, or to any who have been experiencing the lies of the enemy, that they would speak the word of God boldly. I pray for my brothers and sisters, strengthen them. But let us not fall asleep in the complacency that the enemy sends our way. Let us not assume that we are not in a battle. Let us assume that we must fight against the enemy. Lord, we trust you. Our prayers to you indicate that trust. We lay claim on the assurance that we have in you. All that we need is found in you. So 
strengthens the week. Because God, this week, give us all that we need to trust and follow you. In Jesus' name.